<clears throat> I think we all had a grand time yesterday at Don's retirement party, and so on behalf of the entire church, I would just like to say congratulations to him and uh, just express to him our best wishes and our appreciation for all that he has always done for First Assembly. And I know that even though Don is, quote, retiring, he will never stop working, especially for the kingdom of God, as all of us should continue to work always for the kingdom of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you today, and we thank you, Father, for our brother Don. He has been a faithful servant, Lord, both in his work, uh, in his secular work, and especially, Father, he has been a faithful servant in his work for the kingdom of God. We know, Father, that he will continue his faithful service. We pray, Father, a blessing upon him and Norma as they enter retirement years, which can be such a blessing to each other as they have more time to spend together, and it can be a blessing also to you as they have more time to study your word together, pray together, and do things for your kingdom. Father, we commit this day to you. We ask you, Lord, that each one of us today would worship and praise you and that we would dedicate this day and every day of the rest of our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we want to continue to pray for Ron Bork. He is uh, doing better. Uh, Becky went up and spent Friday with him, part of the day Friday. He at least now can talk and things like that. But it's going to be a long road of recovery. He's got to have several therapies. Becky was hoping that he would be able to be moved to uh, Richmond Hospital, but they said the nearest one that can treat him after his trach is, um, I think they said in Muncie. So that's still pretty far away. It's a little closer than Indianapolis, but not a lot. So uh, continue to pray for him and Becky there. Uh, also, uh, what other announcements do we have? Remember, VBS is coming up. And uh, invite some folks. If you got neighbors with kids or grandkids or whatever, uh, get ready for VBS. And uh, Marcia could, I'm sure, use help. So if you'd like to help her with VBS, be sure to let her know. Uh, singing, we've got the next uh, almost two months of Saturdays booked up. And if you want to go to a outdoor singing with a big pitch in uh, and about two, sun, uh, two Saturdays away, the 21st of July or 22nd of July, out at a farm near Cambridge City, is it Cambridge City? There's going to be an all-day singing on the grounds, the the. Hubbard's, uh, Barb and Ernie have come almost every week since our singing started. They sing almost every week, and uh, I enjoy hearing Barb and Ernie sing. And they uh, have this singing every year that grew from 15 people to over 200. So among other things, I'm going to have flyers to pass out about our Saturday singing. And our Saturday singing, uh, the last two Saturdays, uh, nine different churches have been represented by at least one person. Amen? Nine different churches gathering together for gospel music, over 20 people, I think, the last couple weeks. So that doesn't seem like many, but it, that's growing slowly but surely, and we're getting some dedicated people. Some people who are coming, we've got uh, Cross Connection coming this Saturday. I've heard them. They're good. They're a gospel trio, and the pastor and his wife sang full-time in a gospel group for a couple decades. And in that group, they had a number 7 and a number 13 hit or 14 hit nationally. So uh, they are pretty good. On the 14th, you better be good because we've got Leroy the Singing Policeman. And uh, Leroy does a good job. He has a little bit more of a country gospel sound, which I like. The 21st is the Singing on the Farms. The 28th, we've got Jeff Owens coming. Uh, the 4th is open right now, but I'm thinking about asking a bluegrass group to come that I heard. If you've never heard bluegrass, you should come. It's awesome to see a, a stand upright bass, a fiddle, a mandolin, a banjo, and a couple guitars and a steel guitar. That's If you've never heard all those instruments together, you ought to come because uh, 
as they say in bluegrass, that's some good picking. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be inviting them. On the 11th, we actually have a, our first true male quartet. Blessed Truth, probably the best male quartet in Indiana. Uh, the president of the Indiana Gospel Music Association is in that group. They will be here on our stage. On the uh, So a male quartet, if you like good old male quartet music. Uh, then we've got uh, Eddie uh, Rago, who was uh, recommended to us by Cross Connection. The pastors had him, so he should be good. Then I'm looking forward to uh, the 25th of August, Open Arms Project. Uh, three teenagers and their aunt. And their aunt sings with Joe Isaacs. For those of you who know who the Isaacs are, and for those of you who know who Joe Isaacs is. If you like bluegrass, you know who Joe Isaac is. And you know who the Isaacs are. They have several hits. Then we've got, um, so that's the 25th of August. The 1st of September, we've got Sarah Collins is coming back from Fort Wayne. For those of you that like your gospel music a little more contemporary, I would really call her kind of pop contemporary more than more than southern gospel. On the 10th through the 15th, we are planning to show on our screen and in the back every night uh, from a Monday through a Saturday, the National Quartet Convention live webcast. And we're going to try to have a couple di uh, meals in the back that week where you can go back there and eat because it will also be on the 50-inch TV back there. We're going to try to get Don, who's now retired, to make a meal one night. We're going to try to get Charlie to make a meal one night. Can we talk you into it one night, Charlie? From the uh, 10th through the 15th. So that will be a lot of fun. If you've never been to a National Quartet Convention, every major gospel group in the nation sings and soloists and groups and everything. Uh, then Car uh, Catherine's coming back. Catherine is an excellent local singer. She will be with us September the 8th. She's one of the best singers we've had. Real, how would you describe her, Lynn? Country soul. How's that sound? <laughs> She's kind of country soul. She sings with all her heart. That girl puts it all on the line for the Lord, doesn't she? Amen. Who can remember the first law of stewardship? Sharon, what is it? Everything belongs to God, and that law is called the law of rightful ownership. The law of rightful ownership says this, nothing we have is truly our own, we are nothing more than stewards. Everything belongs to God. Who can remember the second and third law? Either one of the two. I don't have my notes I can remember, but of course I taught it. Anybody can paraphrase it? Or The second law is the law of purposeful possession. The law of purpo purposeful possession says that uh, it's about stewardship, not about hoardship. A lot of people think being a good steward is dying with the most stuff or dying w with the most money or, you know, good stewardship is, is keeping everything I've got, being real, real, real conservative with it. That's not good stewardship in God's kingdom. Good stewardship in God's kingdom is listening to God and doing with your possessions what? God says. That's the law of purposeful possession. Who can remember the third law of stewardship? Well, you can remember it now. Kathy's cheating. Is the law of miraculous multiplication. That simply states, and many people have, how many of you have seen miraculous multiplication in your life before? Raise your hand. Come on. You've seen it. When you gave out of need, when you did not have it, and God somehow multiplied it. And that's because in the kingdom of God, it's not earthly economics that count. It is spiritual economics. Amen? Supernatural. And when you, when you trust God in your giving, you can believe God to meet your needs. 
Amen? Uh, I was married with uh, one child, one child on the way, and left a full-time teaching job to start looking for an opportunity to enter the ministry. My wife went along with that. We had $5,000 in the bank that I hoped would last me long enough to uh, withdraw it from my teacher retirement, hoped it would last long enough to, uh, uh, to see me get a church. Well, I, pl- I thought it might last six months. It lasted about two months. And uh, then we didn't have nothing. And God provided a job. And it wasn't long after that, God provided a church. Amen? But the amazing thing is this. In all that time when our income was incredibly low, God supplied every need. I don't ever remember going hungry. Do you, Sharon? (laughs) So God supplied all of our needs. So if our ushers will come up, we will take up our tithes and offerings. This is our opportunity to put some of these laws of stewardship into practice. God wants to see us uh, fulfill these laws of stewardship. In the next couple of weeks, I'll share a couple new laws. But uh, please try to remember these. I see, I see that. You know, First Assembly's new trend is the uh, Hawaiian shirts. So. If you don't have them, I can tell you where to get them. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity to give. We ask you to bless the gift and the giver in the precious name of Jesus. Father, we believe your word. We know that we are stewards. We know that everything we have is truly yours. Every ability we have to earn an income is yours. Everything we have is yours. We know, God, that our responsibility is to be faithful stewards so that one day you will look at us and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, Father, we know that, God, the economics of the world doesn't work in the kingdom because in the kingdom, faithfulness is what counts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Please do your best. Remember that when you're on vacation or miss a week or two, uh, all the bills of the church march right on. Just because you're out uh, a week or two doesn't mean that anything has uh, uh, gone away. They don't go away. They stay here. Are you ready to praise the Lord? All right, let's stand together and let's worship the Lord. Stand as long as you can and give God some glory and honor this morning. Yeah.
taking a few minutes at the end of a song and just worshiping him and just just praying to him. Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Kind of let the song sink in. Kind of let a prayer sink in. of the week or not. We just let his presence sink in. Just kind of meditate on his glory.
sing a simple song to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things He does, my loving Savior. As Ben continues to play that song, I'd like for us to come up and receive the elements of communion and return to our seats. What better way to take communion than on a song in your arms of love? Amen. So just make your way to the front to receive the elements.
thinking about that song as you do because it is the love of Christ. Having Jesus hold us in his arms of love, Lord, those arms were outstretched and his hands and wrists were pierced by nails. He suffered a humiliating death on the cross to pay the price and the sacrifice so that we might know the love of God. The Apostle Paul shared, For I received from the Lord that which I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. When you get a chance to turn your cups to the trash can there. That sounds like an old hymn. Are you ready to sing it? skipped out on me. <laughs> so I'm going to have to preach fast. Hey. 
definitely give Ben, Emily, and Dusty a hand. Would you do that? We appreciate so much their hard work. Uh, why are we spending so much time on the gift of tongues? Well, because that's part of what is a distinctive to us as uh, assemblies of God. That is part of what is distinctive to us as classical Pentecostals. It is one of our cardinal truths. As a matter of fact, when I interview candidates for uh, credentialing with the Assemblies of God, we must always ask this question. There are no options. I'm on the credentialing committee. We, we must always ask them, what is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they have to answer, without exception, speaking in tongues. On their test, which they take a, a test for certification, they take a test for licensing, and they take a test for ordination. So when a person's um, um, Assembly of God minister, they have been through three interviews, they have been through hours of study, and there are certain uh, courses that must be taken. And on their test, it's pass-fail except for one question. One question is an automatic fail. And that question is, what is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? They must answer speaking in tongues. If they don't answer speaking in tongues, they do not get credentialed with the Assemblies of God. They do not pass their tests. They can get... 99 questions right. But when they get that one question wrong, they will not be ordained in our particular uh, movement and fellowship. I've told this story before, and I could tell a couple others, but I think it's probably the best illustration. For six, almost seven years, Sharon and I ministered on a uh, Southern Baptist campus. I was brought up and raised to Southern Baptist. That's how I went to a Southern Baptist college. And God ordained it so that I could meet my wonderful wife. Amen? Everybody give my wife a hand. Would you do that? I've said many times, and I say it again, that I would not be standing here as a minister without for the full support of my wife. She has always been there for me and always been a support for me. And the, the most the precious thing I came out of Cumberland with, Cumberland College, was... Not a degree, but it was my wife. And so uh, we ministered to a lot of Southern Baptist students, and we had a guy from Berea, I think his name was Steve. Sharon can probably remember better than I can. And uh, he was new to the whole charismatic thing. We didn't call ourselves Pentecostals. We considered ourselves charismatics. And uh, Steve was living in a house that Sharon and I rented, and there was... Uh, at various times, a bunch of different people lived with us. Sharon always liked it when the girls lived with us because the house was always somehow neater and quieter. And when the guys lived with us, how, what was the most people we had living? Five guys and my wife and I. It was a big house. So uh, we, we had Jesus houses. We didn't even know they were Jesus houses, but that's exactly what they were. But Steve uh, was in one of our uh, rooms, paid a portion of rent, and uh, one night at about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, he was awakened. He had a dream, a disturbing dream of a man back in Berea. Now, you've heard me tell this story, but it's probably the best illustration I know personally of this truth. And uh, Steve knew this man, and in his dream, he appeared sick. So Steve woke up, and got out of bed and began to pray for him because he felt burdened to pray. Well, he got down on his knees by his bed and he prayed, and the burden didn't lift and only intensified. Finally, he decided, I have got to go to sleep after about a half an hour of praying. He said, I've got to go to sleep. So he got up and went back to bed. Well, it didn't lift. It only intensified. And so he got up and he prayed some more. Finally, in desperation, unable to get this burden of prayer to lift, he had recently just been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and I had recently taught a sermon about the importance of praying in the Spirit. I had taught when you do not know how you ought to pray. 
then the Holy Spirit comes to you and helps you through tongues pray the perfect will of God and what needs to be prayed. And so Steve, new to the baptism and very new to tongues, said, I think I'll try that. And so he began to pray in tongues for his friend. And immediately the burden left him. And he looked at the clock. Thank God, it's about 3.15. I'm finally going to get to go to bed. He'd been up praying for a half hour, 45 minutes or longer. But immediately when he began to pray in spirit, in the spirit, in tongues, the burden left him. Now, Steve didn't even tell us this until weeks later when he had gone home to Berea for a weekend. And he had met this man at a supermarket. And he remembered the day and the night. And he said, hey, was anything going on with you a couple weeks ago on a Thursday night? And the guy kind of looked at him. He said, why? He said, well, you came to me in a dream and you looked very ill. So I got out of bed and prayed for you. And Steve didn't mention that he would prayed in tongues. And the man said, well, he said, it's the oddest thing. He said, I was laying in bed asleep. And at 3.15, he said, I know exactly what time it is because I looked at the clock. He said, a voice shouted to me, get up, get up, get out of bed now. Get the wife and kids, get out of the house. He said, I thought someone was there and had shouted that to me. So he said, I screamed for the wife, get the kids, let's get out. She immediately grabbed the kids from various rooms and they started out the house. He, remember, looked at the clock because of the time. And he said, as we left the door of the first story, the roof collapsed in flames upon the second story and began to fall through the third story, or through the ground floor where we were. If he hadn't have gotten up at that precise time, seconds to spare, they would have perished the entire family steve returned and told us he remembered the time i think the clocks in the house had even stopped at that time it was 3:15 in the morning he said pastor king that's exactly the time the burden lifted from me and i returned to bed come on give the lord some praise Now, I often jokingly say, well, it's a good thing that he prayed in tongues or his friend would have died healed. Because what Steve thought was he looked sick, so I'm going to pray for him to be well. Well, he wasn't sick, and the Holy Spirit knew he wasn't sick. The prayer that needed to be prayed had nothing to do with his physical health. The Holy Spirit wanted the prayer prayed that God would send angels or whatever it was to wake him up and get him and his family out of that house. And so that's why it's so important to pray in tongues. Let me tell you a couple things as we get started because i got a lot I want to cover. Number one is God loves you whether you speak in tongues or not. Don't think God doesn't love you if you don't speak in tongues. Now the scripture says seek spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So even, even prophecy is a gift, especially for church, that is considered uh, more desirable than even tongues. But the Apostle Paul makes it clear, desire spiritual gifts. There's nothing wrong with desiring spiritual gifts from God. How many of you ask God to give you other blessings in your life? How many of you pray for your health, or pray for your finances, or pray for your lost loved ones? God delights in giving us things. And God will delight in giving you the gift of of tongues and giving you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But whether you have that gift or not, God still loves you. Number two, you don't have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. There is one Pentecostal denomination, the Apostolics, which in my opinion are borderline Christian cult because they deny the Trinity. Not only do they deny the Trinity, but more importantly, what makes them a heresy If you can't call them a cult, they're certainly biblically a heresy is because they say unless you're baptized in the name of Jesus only and unless you speak in tongues in many of their churches, you're not going to go to heaven. Well, that's a lot. Amen? You know, I I have many Baptist brothers that will maybe never speak in tongues and they're going to go to heaven. And I have a lot of family that don't speak in tongues. 
but they believe in Jesus, they're going to go to heaven. Amen? So it's got nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. So please understand that. Number three, speaking in tongues doesn't make you a better Christian than those who don't. You know, just because you speak in tongues doesn't make you better than those who don't. And just because you don't doesn't make you inferior to those who do. It's a matter of God giving you something that will make you individually better. I know many people who are not, who do not speak in tongues, who are more mature and more spiritual than a lot of folks I know who do speak in tongues. That's the simple truth of the matter. And so do not think that, that we look down on you or that you are somehow inferior to those who do. You, you are in no way inferior. And if you speak in tongues, as I have for over 40 years, 42 years, uh, do not think that that makes you superior to others. It does not. Amen? You're not one whit better than anybody else. You know, it's all a matter of what you do with your life and what you do with the gift. Number four, it's not about seeking tongues. It's about seeking God. I have a friend who told me this story. He didn't know anything about tongues. When you're in different denominations, especially years and years ago, things like tongues never even got preached. I mean, this one brother, when it happened to him, he said, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. And he said, I'd read the Bible through. And one day driving along, he was a very dedicated young minister to God. And he, uh, in his car, he said, God, I just want to totally surrender. I want to be totally filled with you. I want everything you have for me. And he said, he's driving along in his car, and he said, all of a sudden, the power of God hit me. He said, I couldn't drive. He said, I had to pull the car off the side of the road. And he said, I'm staggering out of the car into a little gully off the side of the road and falling on my knees before God. And he said, I lift my hands. And he said, I didn't know what the heck was going on. And he said, and all of a sudden, I started speaking in tongues. He said, I didn't even know what it was. I thought there for a minute I'd lost my mind. <laughs> but he said it was just such a blessing to him. But you see, he wasn't seeking tongues. He was just seeking God. If you seek God, if you seek everything God has for you, if you seek God's face and you totally surrender to him, then finally just relax. Worship him. Pray and study God's word. Amen. A lot of people I know who have prayed to receive the baptism didn't immediately speak in tongues, and, and they do things like sing in the shower. And, you know, I like putting worship tapes on and sing in the shower with my worship tapes. Uh, every once in a while, it's Johnny Cash worship or, you know, Willie Nelson singing hymns. But anyway, most of the time it's, uh, it's more spiritual than that. But, but um, I've had friends that have been in the shower and suddenly start singing in tongues. Days after being prayed for. Weeks after being prayed for for the baptism. But it came. Amen? But you got to just relax. Everybody say relax. Amen. All right. Quick review. Number one. To, tr to truly understand tongues, you need to understand how God made mankind. Remember, we are made in, in a trinity. Go to the scripture. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. Go to the next one. So God is a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to know how to say the trinity, a trinitarian truth, it's right there. That's all you got to know is the very next phrase. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, not three gods but one. Neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. What does that mean? It means simply that everything in the universe that makes up God is co-inhabited by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their substance cannot be divided. That's why when Jesus walked the earth, the Scripture says the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him in bodily form. Amen. 
When he hung on the cross and said, My God, my God, why dost thou forsaken me? He did not become any less God. He merely felt that the Father had, you know, uh, he was on the cross. He was expressing part of the agony of the cross. In reality, God had not forsaken him. He can't because he's God. He never gave up his Godhood. So remember that. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. You have the body that God formed out of the ground. You have the spirit, which is the breath of life. The very Hebrew word for breath is spirit. And then you have man becoming a living soul. Many of your versions will say, a living being. And then finally, how are we created in the image of God? God is a trinity. We are a what? We are a trinity. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So that is important. In reality, that the teaching of the, tri, uh, the trinity of man, I'm doing that at the Hope House. Because those guys need to understand the importance of spirit, soul, and body. A lot of people don't advance very far spiritually until they understand uh, that they are spirit, soul, and body. Because many of the things that we do as Christians, we give up doing because we don't see as great an effect on our bodies or on our souls. And what we don't realize is we are feeding our spirits. Amen? So why is that important to tongues? Well, it's important to tongues because uh, tongues is the means that God gave our spirits to communicate directly with Him. The gift of tongues has to do with the trinity of man. The gift of tongues has to do with the fact that God, who is spirit, is giving your spirit the means to communicate directly to Him. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, in the what? In the what? He speaks mysteries. Verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, what? But my understanding is unfruitful. What is the outcome then, or the conclusion? I will pray, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing. And I will also sing with the understanding. So it is clear in the Scripture that our spirits communicate with God through the gift of tongues. Amen? You can worship God with your body. You can worship God with your soul. But to worship God completely and truly with the Spirit, you need this means of communication. The next one. It is also that we worship God in the Spirit with the gift of tongues. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. You know, the person who's speaking back to me the loudest, and I like that, is Barbara, who's recovering from heart surgery. (laughs) So when I point to you to make sure you're awake, do your part. (laughs) But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father. You're, You're still not getting it. In spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. For God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now again, it's real simple. If praying in the Spirit is tongues, and if singing in the Spirit is tongues, what do you think worship in the Spirit would be? Tongues. It's just logic. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Not commentaries and not man's doctrine. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Today we're going to look at the uh, praying in tongues or praying in the spirit all that was review number one he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God 
Now, one of the last sermons will be on the gift of tongues for the church. And this isn't talking about the gift of tongues for the church. Because if you have a gift of tongues for the church, you're not speaking to God, but you're speaking to the church. So this is obviously talking about uh, praying or or worshiping God, because it says, for he who uh, speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. What do we generally call speaking to God? When, when, When we pray, we call that what? We call that speaking with God. We call that talking to God. Amen? So that's what he's talking about. Number two, for no one understands him. Now there are those who argue that all tongues must be known spoken languages because of the description on the day of Pentecost. Now, if you will let me, I'm going to chase a rabbit. Fenders under these puppies. Uh, the belts on the tightest it'll go. And I don't want to lose my drawers. <laughs> Especially not on you stream. It would go viral. You know it would. Pastor loses pants. <laughs> All right. Gets so excited during sermon he loses his pants. Uh, some will argue that all tongues must be known language because of the description of the day of Pentecost. That's an argument that many make. Um, tongues has been scientifically studied. I have two books on the subject. Tongues has been scientifically studied. And as far as I know in all the latest research that I have found, uh, it does not, it has never been found to be a known language. Now, there are many anecdotal stories uh, that have been affidavits made and everything else where people have sworn that they have heard people speaking in tongues and it was a language they knew. And what I'm going to say about the day of Pentecost, this rabbit I'm going to hunt, is this. I don't think the day of Pentecost was a miracle of speaking. I think the day of Pentecost was a miracle of hearing. Let's run it down. Go real fast. So you're about to get some new stuff. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and they were, uh, and it filled the whole house where they were setting. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Go to the next one. Now there were then residing in Jerusalem devout, or uh, Jerusalem Jews devout and God-fearing men from every country under heaven. And when this sound was heard, the multitude came together and they were astonished and bewildered because each one of them heard the apostles speaking in his own particular dialect. Go to the next one. And they were beside themselves with amazement saying, Are not all these Galileans who are talking? How is it then that we hear each of us in our own particular dialect to which we were born. And it ends with, there's 16 regions, 16 regions of the world listed. We're closing to the last two. The last two are Cretans and Arabs too. And within each of these regions, there could be dozens of dialects. Dozens of dialects. We all hear them speaking in our own native tongues and telling of the mighty works of God. Now go back to a couple of previous verses, Kathy, bewildered and astonished. Now let's visit the day of Pentecost. There's at least 120 people in the upper room. They come rushing out of the upper room. They're all praising God at the top of their lungs. There are people there, God-fearers, which are Gentiles that have not yet fully converted to Judaism. And there are devout Jews from all over the world because they are commanded, all males, to come to Jerusalem for four feasts a year, including Pentecost. The population of Jerusalem during these feasts would swell to over a million people. Again, one of the largest cities in the ancient world during festival times. And 
outrun these 120 people. Now, if I'm a Cretan and I hear one person out of 120, first of all, that's a miracle in and of itself, that I'm standing by the one person who happens to be be speaking uh, a Cretan dialect, and I, I know from his dress that he's a Galilean or from his language, but would that leave me astonished or bewildered or amazed? He might be a Galilean that knows Crete. Amen? No, I believe this is what astonished them. I believe this is what bewildered them. I believe this is what amazed them. There are people there from 16 regions of the world, and each one of them hears the entire crowd praising God in their language. And it bewilders them. It is, how is it, you know, how is it that you're an Arab and you hear them speaking in Arabic? How is it that I'm a Roman and I hear hear them speaking in Latin? How is it that I'm an Arab and I hear them speaking in Arab? That is what amazed them. That is what bewildered them. I believe the day of Pentecost was not a miracle of, of language, of speaking. I believe it was a miracle of hearing. Amen? And at least 16 regions of the world. Let me give you an example. At Cumberland... Sharon and I ministered for six and a half years. And there were a uh, hundred students who were baptized with the Holy Spirit while we were there. 100, over 100. I have them listed in journals. And they came for, they were Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic. Most of them were Baptist. And two of these young ladies, they had these Arabs that had started coming to our school. And these Arab boys were interested in these girls and uh, they were walking and talking with them, and they were talking about religion and faith. And uh, these Arab boys uh, wanted to know about Christianity, and they told them, well, we're charismatics, and da-da-da-da, and we speak in tongues. And that fascinated these Arab boys, and they said, you speak in tongues? They said, well, would you do that for us? And the girls thought, well, I don't know why not. Why not? And so they began to pray, and they began to pray in the Spirit. And the two Arab boys got very upset. And, and the boy said, when did you learn Arabic? Why are you doing this? And they said, what do you mean? We don't speak Arabic. And they both said, but we heard you. You said in Arabic that Allah is a false god. That Muhammad is a false prophet. That the only true Son of God is Jesus. And that He is the Messiah. Amen? Now, I don't know if either of those girls spoke one word of Arabic. What I know is, when those boys heard, the Holy Spirit had them hear Arabic. Amen? Now, they may very well have spoke Arabic. I'd heard them speak in tongues many times. I never heard anything that sounded Arabic. You know, my own uh, tongues sometimes sounds like maybe one language, sometimes sounds a little like another language. You know, I don't know what I'm speaking, and I don't care. I'm communicating with God in the Spirit. But I could give you countless, countless examples. There's an excellent book, They Speak With Other Tongues. It's one of the oldest books about the charismatic movement and the gift of tongues. It tells some fascinating stories. A man who's praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a mountain retreat gets filled with the Spirit, goes running down the mountain, shouting in tongues. He's so happy. And another man jumps up off a porch and runs beside him and starts shouting in tongues with him. When they get to the bottom of the hill, the other guy's hugging him and jumping around. And he said, did you get it too? Did you get it too? And he said, get what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. You were speaking in tongues. He said, I wasn't speaking in tongues. I'm a Pole. I was speaking Polish. He said, I thought you were another Pole who was a Christian. He said, why would that be? He said, you came down this mountain shouting how great God was and how great Jesus is. And and he said, I just thought you were worshiping God, so I decided to join you. There was a Chinese or a Japanese war bride who married an American soldier. He belonged to a Pentecostal church. When he went up to pray in his church to Jesus, she went up to pray to Buddha. She was a devout Buddhist. But she was a devout 
be a dutiful Japanese wife. She accompanied her husband. Whatever he did, she did. So he got, gets up and goes to the altar in this Pentecostal church. His wife gets up, goes to the altar beside him. A woman on the other side of her goes to the altar and begins to say in what's the equivalent in Japanese of King James English. The Japanese have a high Japanese, which is for temple worship and uh, those kinds of things. And in high Japanese, the woman beside her says to her, Why are you worshiping a false god? Jesus is the one true son of God. And the woman immediately stops and starts speaking Japanese to her. And the woman turns around and says, Honey, I don't know Japanese. And she says, You were just speaking Japanese. You were witnessing to her. And she says, Honey, I promise you, I don't know Japanese. And she said, Well, speak in tongues again or what you were doing. And when she spoke in it again, she didn't hear Japanese at all. You see, in many of these cases, I believe what's happening, and I definitely am now convinced that it's what's happening on the day of Pentecost. So it's like Star Trek's universal translator, for those of you who are Trekkies. You know, Star Trek's universal translator. When God wants to communicate through the gift of tongues, he can miraculously give people a known language or... He can simply cause you to hear the language that you know. And I think on the day of Pentecost, what astonished them, amazed them, and bewildered them is they're from 16 regions with dozens of dialects, and they all heard the crowd in their own particular dialect, praising God. And that would truly be astonishing and amazing and bewildering. Come on, give the Lord some praise. So I don't know if you ever thought about that, but that rabbit's free. I just, uh, you know, I've preached this thing for 40 years, and that was a complete new revelation to me. Okay, returning to speaking in tongues, I got like seven minutes to try to wrap this up. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, I want you to remember that mysteries. I want you to remember that in the Spirit, you speak mysteries. Uh, we should pray in tongues and with our understanding. We read that, 1 Corinthians fourteen fifteen. I will pray in the Spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. Why pray in tongues? Go with me to Romans eight twenty six. That's probably as far as I'll get. I probably won't get to 1 Corinthians, Kathy. So, too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplications and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings which, by the way, can be translated, many of your Bibles say with groanings or whatever, it can be translated from the Greek, unintelligible sounds. What is speaking in tongue? Unintelligible sounds. And I believe that speaking in tongues is what this passage is talking about, with groanings too deep for utterance. Go to verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, if I had time, we would go to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, which God gave me a few years ago, well, probably less than a year ago, a real understanding that that chapter is talking about tongues, the whole latter part of that chapter. Because of the word mysteries and because of some of these phrases. The, it says in 1 Corinthians 2, who knows the heart of man except the spirit of man? Who knows the heart of God except the spirit of God? And when we pray in tongues, we are praying according to the will of God. And look at verse 28, which has been my life verse for as long as I can remember. I can't remember a time that that I had not taken that verse. Are you trying to out-preach me, little guy? Come on, Yosei. Preach it. 
Uh, and we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now, Sharon, what is the and there? It's a conjunction. I have to ask her. I barely speak American, let alone English. What is a conjunction? It connects two thoughts together. That means that verse 28 does not stand alone. It is connected to verse 27. And verse 27 is talking about praying in tongues. And when we pray in tongues, we're praying the perfect will of God. And when we're praying the perfect will of God, then all things work together for our good. Come on, give the Lord some praise. I'll close, and next week we'll look at uh, some more. I'll close with this story. Many years ago, when I uh, first quit teaching school to begin to look for a full-time church, we were attending a church where I taught every Sunday night. And it was a nice church, and I really felt a strong connection there. And the people uh, enjoyed my teaching and everything. And I hadn't considered that particularly the place I was going to serve, but suddenly a pastor came from Florida who a lot of these people had known. And uh, this pastor came, and uh, one of the elders of the church, there were two elders in the church, one of the elders of the church, the Lord told him, this pastor has a word of the Lord for you, and I want you to be there. Well, he said, well, I don't like going anywhere without my wife, and she's at work, Lord. So if somehow she doesn't have to work, then we can go. And so at work, a woman walked up to his wife and said, Hey, I, I hear Brother LeMasters is in town, and he's speaking at a friend's house tonight, one of your friends, and I know you would like to go, so I'll work for you tonight. So she comes home and tells her husband, You know, hey, God uh, made a way for us to go tonight. So then he knew it was the Lord. It was confirmed. The masters near the end of the evening, this guy kept waiting for the word of the Lord. But near the end of the evening, the masters pulled him aside and the other elder aside. And he said, I, I met this Carlos King guy, and he's supposed to be the pastor of First Christian Church of Charlestown. Now, they already had a pastor. Now, I did everything in my human power to make that come to pass. I really did, because I thought that was God's will for my life. He'd sent a man they recognized as a prophet to say that. I did things I shouldn't have done to try to make that come to pass. I, I made a, an Ishmael. How many of you know what an Ishmael is? An Ishmael is when it's God's promise to an Isaac, and you get tired of waiting, and you do your own thing. So I, I even made an Ishmael. The point is this, I lifted that whole situation up almost daily in tongues, in the Spirit. And it ended up coming to pass that I did not even have an opportunity to try out for that church. One of the, one of the guys in the charismatic movement, they recognized the fivefold ministry. Uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I was recognized by many churches in southern Indiana for a number of years as a teacher i taught in five different churches weekly and this pastor said or this elder said king is not a a pastor he's a teacher and so he wouldn't even allow my name to be put up so that whole thing that i thought god was going to promise me fell through and i was very disappointed i was very hurt how many of you have ever been hurt when you thought god was going to give you something and it didn't come to pass. Come on, raise your hand. Of course, we're, we're hurt. But I lifted the whole situation up in tongues constantly. And I believe that what happened by lifting it up in tongues is that God caused all things to work together for my good. It was God's perfect will for me not to be in that church, but to be in the assemblies of God to be eventually at Shelbyville for eight and a half years, which was a very hurting church that Sharon and I brought healing to, and then to come here, which I think this is the, was God's destination 25 years ago. 
Come on, give the Lord some praise. I believe this was God's destination 25 years ago. And I believe that I was able to get by that Ishmael by praying in the Spirit. And so if you, the reason to pray with your understanding and in the Spirit is this. In the Spirit, you're praying the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God. Amen. Now, we can pray the best we can, and God will honor that. Amen. All prayer is important. That's why Paul said, also pray with your understanding. But something that we'll see next week, when we begin to pray in the Spirit, we enter a spiritual realm of mystery, a spiritual realm of truth. We begin speaking forth in the Spirit what eye has not seen nor ear heard that God has prepared for those who love him. We begin to speak a wisdom and an understanding of the spirit realm that cannot be comprehended in the soulish realm because God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. Amen? So there are things that happen when we begin to enter the spiritual realm, which is why God wants to give us that gift of tongues. Do you remember the scripture where we talked about the Tower of Babel? God confused their languages because God said, if I don't confuse their languages, nothing will be impossible for them. Well, God is raising up 600 million Christians that speak the same language. Tongues. And, folks, the world is being saved. Arabs are having dreams and visions of Jesus. God is moving all over the world because when he brings together an army of people that speak the same language, nothing shall be impossible for them. So if we'll believe God, a great revival can come to America because nothing is impossible for us. Let's give the Lord some praise. Amen. <clears throat> Would you stand together? Once again, I just want to encourage you. Folks, I I've taught some of this. I taught some of this a year or two ago uh when we were having the citywide prayer meetings and, and once a month we met on Friday night. And there were several charismatics in the in the crowd who had received tongues but really hadn't used them. Even Mary Jo said, you know, I I had tongues, but I really didn't start using it, Pastor King, until you taught me. And now she uses it all the time. And there were several people in that crowd who said, you know, I've got the gift of tongues way back when, but I, I just haven't really been using it. And now they understand it, and now they begin to use it. I encourage you here. To the altar's open for you to come around and kneel and pray quickly and say, God, I want your everything you've got for me. I want spiritual gifts. Or I want you to come and say, Lord, I want to use my gift of tongues more. I want to get back on track with my prayer life. I want to pray with my understanding, but I also want to pray in the Spirit. I want to worship with my understanding, but I also want to worship in the Spirit. You come quickly. We're not going to tarry long. And if you speak in tongues, I want you to come and say, God, I want more. I want more. Sharon, Lynn, Vicki, come and pray for Sister Oakley. I want more. I want more of God's power. I want more of God's presence. I want more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you spoke in tongues once years ago. Let me tell you, God doesn't want you to speak in tongues once years ago. Maybe you're more classical Pentecost in your thinking. And, uh, well, you know, you can only speak in tongues when the Holy Spirit jerks your tongue around. Grabs control of you. No, you got to pump, prime the pump. Sometimes you just have to begin to pray in the Spirit uh, as best you can in the flesh. And the Spirit will take over. The Spirit will take over. And you will begin to move and flow in the Spirit of God. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we surrender totally and completely to you. God, we ask that you uh, visit the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon our sister, uh, Sister Oakley, Lord God. Father, it's not something that we have to understand. It's simply something we believe. 
God, in the name of Jesus, let the power of your spirit begin to flow through her, even now and especially in the coming days. Let her have a yearning in her heart to speak words that she doesn't even understand. Let the groanings of the spirit rise up within her. If you will worship God and worship God and worship God, you will run out of English. Suddenly, if you want to continue to worship him, something's got to come from deep inside you. And what comes from deep inside you is your spirit. Your spirit begins to cry out to God. Hallelujah. 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 Just begin to worship him, folks. Oh, Lord, we worship you, Lord. We bring honor and glory to your name, O Lord. We magnify your name, O Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Even on your own, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit after three nights of praying, totally on my own. No one laid hands on me. No one did anything like that. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues just by asking God, I want your power. I want the baptism. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It might be three days. It might be six days. I don't know how long it will be. But God said, if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. Amen? Sometimes you've got to seek for a while. And you've got to listen to the Lord. There may be something, there may be something sometimes blocking it. A lack of total surrender or some area of your life that the Lord wants uh, taken care of before you progress to the next step that's not always the case but it sometimes is the case and so be aware of that and just be obedient to the lord most importantly folks we're not here to spiritually stress you out we're here to tell you truths that we hope will improve your life and the best thing i can say to you is this relax in god just relax amen and just trust the lord And God will move on you. Father, we thank you for today. And we thank you, Lord, for the marvelous, wonderful gift of your Spirit. We thank you, God, that you have given us by your Spirit the ability to communicate directly with you through the gift of tongues. We thank you, Lord, that when we pray in tongues, all things work together for our good. We pray the perfect will of God. And God, we thank you that even if we don't have that ability, we can still pray to you to the best of our ability. And you are a God who hears us and who answers our prayers and who loves his people. So, Father, I just pray the blessing of God on every man, woman, and child that is here today. Continue to heal Barb. Lord, we pray continue to touch her and strengthen her. Continue to heal Sister Erickson, Lord. We're praying and believing that you will raise her up miraculously. Father, continue to heal Brother Ron Bork and do a total healing in him, Lord. And Father, continue to heal Sherry, Lord. Lord, we're believing that her doctors are going to say we do not understand it. This disease has stopped in its tracks. And touch and heal Rhonda's arm, Lord, and her fingers and and everything that is there. Touch that break, Lord God. Lay your hands on her, Charlie, there. Just hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, just touch Rhonda. Lord, mend those bones. Mend those breaks. Let there not be any serious breaks whatsoever or any damage, Lord, whatsoever. And Father, we pray for the Peg family. We lift Dana up and we pray for a continued touch of God in her life. And Lord, every person that is here today, you know what each and every person needs. So do it according to your riches in glory in Jesus' name. And everybody that agreed said, 
Amen. Give God praise. Hallelujah.